Uh, welcome everyone, thanks for coming. Hey, hey how you doing? Uh, I'm Kevin Sandler, I'm a professor in Film and Media Studies, and uh, welcome to our first annual uh, FMS uh, alumni event. So thank you all for attending. Uh, we are, uh, this is, goes from 4.30 to 5.45. It's also being uh, videotaped so we can then stream it for uh, students who aren't, uh, aren't here who, who are online. Uh, so be aware that there's a, there's a camera uh, going on. Uh, let me uh, tell you about kind of the structure of what we'll do. I have um, a set of questions that I'll ask our panel. Uh, and, and then in between, uh, just ask people for questions. We'll have plenty of time for Q&A and, and all that jazz. Uh, so uh, let us begin, because I want to uh, you know, have each uh, person here tell you who they are, when they graduated, and kind of what they do. So uh, let us start with, uh, with Nick. Uh, how is it, Nick? Angulo. Angulo, yes. <laughs> uh, so I graduated uh, May 2009, and I am currently with uh, Sanrio, who has provided these lovely notebooks for all of you. Um, we are the licensing company for Hello Kitty. Um, so, I'm the uh, project associate with the brand management and marketing uh, division in uh, Los Angeles. Um, I graduated in May of 2013. Is that Holly? <laughs> <laughs> Holly Vandenborn. And um, I graduated in May of 2013, and I currently work at STX Entertainment, which is a new studio in LA. And they are on track to produce 16 to 20 titles a year with only 50 employees. Um, before that, I was at Open Road Films, which is a considered a mini, um, sorry, mini major, and there I did theatrical marketing, um, which is what I'm doing now as well. Uh, before I start, I always pictured some kid in the first row doing Taco Bell. Engagement. <laughs> <laughs> like when I was picturing this, I was like, yes, someone's gonna be snacking. So thank you for completing my yeah, so my like, I feel like I've really made it. Um, hi, I'm Megan Evans. I work for Fox Networks in the distribution group. I work in the marketing arm, and we represent all the networks under the Fox umbrella. So anything from Fox Broadcast to Nat Geo, Nat Geo Wild, FX, FXX. Not Fox News or Fox Business, so rest easy. And uh, we manage all the partnerships between us and the distributors. So anything from iTunes, Hulu, Xbox, Comcast, Dish, DirecTV, that's all under our umbrella. And thank you for talking about. We appreciate Del it. Um, do I get an intro? Della Anderson. Della Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> um, you are. Um, I'm Della Anderson. Um, I graduated in May 2012. And I did a, I like worked for a year and hated my life, so I went back to school. Um, and I went to uh, the University of Sussex, which is in England, and did a film program there for a year where I got to write, direct, edit, um, like cast, pretty much like produce and in like a short film, a 20 minute short film. And I finished that in September, and then I moved to LA, and I worked for like two and a half months on a talk show that filmed at CBS Studios called Take Part Live, which you probably never heard of because it's on a network that no one no one got and it also got canceled. So I did that until December. And then in January I got a job at Done and Dusted, which is a live event staging and television production company that's based in Santa Monica. And they do production for live events like the opening and closing ceremonies for the Olympics and all Victoria's Secret runway shows. Um, they're doing the iHeart Radio Music Festival in a week and a couple other projects this summer, like the Kids' Choice Awards and the Laureus Awards, which are coming out of Shanghai. And it's a lot of cool projects that are um, like live event based, and then they do all the production and post for it. Allison. Cool. I'm Allison Miller. That's who I am. Uh, I, work at the, I graduated in May of 2012. Uh, I work at The Gold Company, which is a film, TV, and theater production company. Most recently, we put up the uh, Broadway musical, Holler If You Hear Me, uh, based on the lyrics of Fox Your Core. Um, so that's, so, uh, I'm the executive assistant to the uh, head of the company and the head of development. So it's mostly a lot of like coverage, answering phones, very useful skills that will take me far for the rest of anything, <laughs> assistant-wise. And uh, it's a good term. That's what I do. Uh, my name is Patrick Carroll. I graduated in 2012 also, and uh, I went to work for uh, Paris Screenwriters, a team that wrote Think Like a Man and uh, Friends with Benefits. 
And then uh, about a year and a half ago, they incorporated as a production company. So now I'm uh, their creative guy. I get to chase down <coughs> projects and articles and young writers and scripts and try and turn them into something uh, that we can actively produce. And we just got done shooting a TV pilot up in Portland that I'm really excited about. And, uh, and we're actually looking for summer interns. Um, so I guess talk to Kevin. I was really excited about that. Yeah, so I, <laughs> uh, <laughs> talk to uh, Kevin for more info. I'll be getting him some information soon. Um, but we, yeah, if you can come spend the summer in LA, it could be fun. No promises. <laughs> so a lot of you were very successful uh, shortly after graduation uh, in landing uh, your first positions or second positions uh, in uh, Los Angeles. Can you uh, tell everybody what is it that you did uh, after graduation, both your paid and kind of unpaid jobs, in order to get to the position of where you are now? Who would like to answer that? Uh, Patrick, yours is the easiest. Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> what I did immediately after graduation was actually play video games for money. Um, but, <laughs> uh, but that only lasted for a short while. Um, really, the groundwork for landing the position I'm in came from doing uh, an internship my junior year with Zucker Productions, Jerry Zucker, Airplane, Kentucky Fried Movie, Naked Gun, all those films. Uh, worked with him for a summer, came back to ASU, and then out of pure luck, I studied abroad in Australia where they were making their next film. So I did another summer for them uh, on the Gold Coast of Australia on set, and then uh, when I graduated and was done playing video games, I, uh, I showed up on their doorstep and begged them for any available opportunity, and I happened to have picked the exact moment they were meeting with my current employers, David and Keith, uh, who didn't know they needed an assistant but were overwhelmed and the next day I went to work for them. So I just got insanely lucky. But the internships really were the key there, the personal relationships. Uh, uh, I did, after I, I moved out uh, the summer of, of 2012, I bummed around so, for a little while trying to figure out what to do. I took an unpaid internship for about um, four months at a really, really small non-scripted company slash assistant training program. And from that internship, I got hooked up with a former intern who had my current job and was leaving. And I interviewed there. And she thought it was a gem. And uh, <laughs> an animal gem. And uh, so I got that job. And, and, and that's where I am. What a lovely group of people there. <laughs> Um, I didn't move out to LA right after graduating. Um, I stayed in the Valley for about a year and like just saved money. And, like had a job doing social media for a company that did not need social media. So it was like a whole day of doing like a Facebook post. So um, <laughs> and everyone was old, so they didn't understand it. it took like four seconds. And um, so that was kind of, <laughs> well, I, you know, and um, <laughs> old people technology. And so that's when I decided that I really wanted to go back to school and um, just kind of try something different and try something new. So after coming back from the master's program, because I had to take on so much more responsibility in creating a film and playing all the different parts in constructing it and putting it together, I felt a lot more prepared to move out to LA. And I feel like I, I felt just more comfortable on a set. I felt more comfortable talking to people and telling them what I saw in my head and how I wanted it to come across on a paper or on a daily or things like that. So that was incredibly helpful. And then when I moved, because I went to England for this program, the company that I currently work for is half in London and half in Santa Monica. And <coughs> a crucial part of me getting the job was the fact that I studied for a year in England and they felt like, well, at least I'll be comfortable with the people who work there and you know that kind of thing. So I guess know people. I guess just try and know people. <laughs> try and meet try and meet and network with as many people as you possibly can and that's who's gonna get you a job and that's who's gonna help you out and get you to the next level. Uh, so the summer before I graduated, I interned in LA at a network called Fox Reality Channel, which no longer exists. Um, but I spent the summer there, and then I came back to finish my semester here, graduated, and then I shortly thereafter moved to LA. And um, before I started at Fox, I worked at CBS as a page. 
so like Kenneth from 30 Rock, the blazer and everything. So we worked on like Price is Right and Dancing with the Stars and Bill Maher. So I did that for three months or so. And then the, the woman I had interned for at Fox Reality had then moved to Fox Networks and they were looking for an assistant. And we had stayed in touch, so she reached out to me and then I interviewed and I've been there for four and a half years now. So to Della's point, mm -hmm. make connections and, and build those bridges. You never and, know. Yeah, mm -hmm. and really foster those relationships because they'll think of you if you prove your merit. Um, well, I was kind of the exception That's to that. Yeah. My story is a little weird. After I graduated, I went to Europe for a few weeks. I went to the Cannes Film Festival, and while I was there, I felt like I could take on the world for some reason. <laughs> so when I got back, I literally didn't say goodbye to anyone. I just packed up my car <laughs> and went to stay on her yeah. couch. She messaged me. She's like, can I show up on Tuesday? I'm like, up next week? She's like, no, in two days. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I guess. Sure. So I, just, I didn't really know her that well, but yeah. I just showed up on her couch. I think for like two weeks I watched Teen Mom while I was applying for jobs. <laughs> and I essentially just used all the entertainment websites. Um, there's like entertainmentcareers.net, UTA Jobless. I really applied to anything and everything on there. And I happened to apply for a position at Open Road Films, which is how I got the job there. You know, they really were just looking for someone fresh out of school and looking for someone where they could pay nothing, essentially. Because I really wanted a job. I was like, you can pay me nothing and I'll work for you. So that's what they did. And then I just kind of worked my way up. I started at the front desk and then I moved um, to the desk of the um, head of distribution there. And so that's how I kind of was able to work my way up without any connections, I guess. So I got kind of lucky, but good. Yeah. Um, so I actually interned the same summer uh, at Fox, uh, not in the same department as Megan. I was with the standards and practices. So um, after that, I actually was able to PA on Kitchen Nightmares, the Gordon Ramsay show, which didn't really lead to anything, unfortunately, and I had to move back to Tucson. Um, interviewed a couple more times in LA, couldn't get it, so I started with the temp company. And they kept me at San Rio, which I could not remember what San Rio was at the time. Ended up taking it. They hired me on as a temp. Stayed there for like three months. Then they hired me as an executive assistant. And five years later, I am now in the marketing team. So I got pretty lucky as far as the LA dream of just going out there and finding something that worked for you. Um, but uh, yeah, I had, a, I had a great time and also, as soon as I got the job with Sanrio, I was actually offered a job with Kitchen Nightmares again, but I decided to go with the uh, Sanrio just because I didn't want to have to travel all over with Kitchen Nightmares shows. So. <coughs> Jeremy. I mean, all of you have mentioned, uh, for the most part, uh, about how important internships are to where you are. Uh, can you kind of specifically kind of focus on that? You know, why are internships important? Not simply after you graduate, if you can find an unpaid internship, but during graduation. How does that help you greatly in terms of landing the next step into getting a job? Well, I mean, honestly, first, as complicated as it might seem, the formula is pretty basic. You just have to find somewhere that you can show up every day and make an impression on people. And if you can generally solve more problems for them than you create, then in general, they're going to think well of you. And it looks good for them to then re recommend you to somebody. You can go over there and be impressive over there and it builds their relationships. Because LA is just a bunch of relationships. Uh, no one has ever seen my resume. Um, it's entirely through just showing up, being not an idiot, and then having somebody recommend you because you've proved that you cannot be an idiot. Um, and then to speak to the internships thing, it's just critical to take advantage of the time now where you're not desperately searching out in the real world to actively take those summers or whenever you can find the time to do it and meet people. Just meet people who are out there doing what you want to do. And that experience is going to be, the education you get here is fantastic, but that hands-on experience is critical. Yeah, you learn a lot about doing like, uh, my first internship was also at, at Zucker, and you learn a lot of really, really important skills. Like that's where I learned how to do coverage. And it sounds simple enough, but you want to make sure that's the skill that got me the job I have now. Like that's really, really important. And it's all about staying in contact with those people. I did my internships my junior year, so obviously still had a year before I graduated, but I stayed in touch with those people. And I've never gotten a job anywhere that, that someone I'd previously known hadn't helped me. And it's not because I look so terrible if I hand you my resume, it's because 
those jobs, like hundreds of people are applying for them. If you see a posting, like like hundreds of people are applying for them. So you really have to kind of know someone just to get your resume read. And it's, it's, it's helpful to have experience to put on there in the first place. I would also say that most people can put together a confident looking resume yes. if you try, and most people can put together a really confident looking cover letter if you try. And I, I mean, in, at the end of the day, that they are gonna look at that, but everyone looks good on paper. And everyone's gonna say the same things about themselves. And everyone's really punctual and really creative and they're resourceful and they can, you know what I mean? Like all the things that like, they all you, know you, can, you, can, like you can research like things to put on a resume. And that's a helpful tool to have, but you can't just put that you're everything because you can't have like, like the bottom half of yours maybe like a list of skills that like everyone, like answering phones isn't really like, you know what I mean? Like I don't know. So you can do you can do that now. As so you the, yeah. So there's lots of skills that you can put on there and lots of things that you can say. But at the end of the day, having an internship and someone seeing you work for three months every single day, or someone seeing you work. I had a three. I, I did the same summer internship that they both did, and I also did a Sundance internship. That was only like a three-day internship, but. The skills that you learn there and you get to look at the way things work and you get to say okay this is what an executive producer does or like this is what uh, uh, this is what a coordinator does because at least when I was in school and I read like a list of like when you look at the end of a movie and you look at all those people's titles like I don't know the difference between one and the other so just to be able to have a time to look at what people do and see I do want to do that or more importantly I don't want to do that um, is a really helpful time it's a really helpful time to do it because you're not getting paid and no one's no, like, no money's exchanging hands, you don't feel guilty, and you don't feel like... Well, and you'll notice one of the common things between all of us is that we all just went out to L.A. Did anybody have a job lined up when no. they went out there? Absolutely no, not. you have to take that leap of faith to just go there, because no one's reading your, your resume with a Tempe address on there. So, to make L.A. a little less scary, to make that just like going out into the void, <laughs> something that seems a little more manageable, having spent some time and knowing someone out there can make that critical difference. You also want someone to vouch for you because you, you spend most of your time at work with your coworkers and you want someone to say like this person, I'm going to curse on camera, this person isn't an asshole, like you want to spend several hours of your day with this individual and that's why the internships are really helpful because you have people who will vouch for you and be like yeah this cool, this girl's great, she's responsible but she's also funny and personable and like she's not going to be rude and she's not going to be contentious in the workplace so you want to build the, that relationship but also set yourself up with a certain reputation of being um, per, like presentable personable. and personable mm -hmm. and just being friendly and then in terms of coming out to LA like if you know people even tenuously out there like Holly yeah like Holly <laughs> so so these three Allison, Della and Holly have all lived with me at one point and so is Freddie here in the front row but if you see him he's terrifying so you'll be like I can't believe you did that um, but you find someone and, and don't be bashful like be be really assertive and ask to stay there ask to sleep on someone's couch ask someone to vouch for you like just put yourself out there and it's scary and awkward, but just do it anyway because it's it's Everyone's so scared, yeah. yeah it's so worthwhile. Yeah. Della and I shared a living room. I didn't know her. I yeah. just didn't talk to her. It was fun. Just a couple of <laughs> a couple of bare mattresses. A couple of bare yeah. mattresses. <laughs> And the dream. Living life. And the dream. And the dream. 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 Yeah. 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 dream. But Holly's a perfect example. Just be like, hey, can I stay? And I was like, well, I can't really say no. So. You're here. <laughs> and I ended up going to Target and buying like a closet. And I like set up a shop in their dining room. Yeah, yeah, you have a much better area than when I was living in Freddie and Megan's room. You had like a stack of like comic books. I, I, I had two banker's boxes that I would set my computer on it. so that I could that watch TV awesome. and a mattress and like a set of plastic drawers. But. And it was like straight, like it was right outside our kitchen. So we'd like go out. It was right in the front door. Just be like sleeping soundly, and we'd be like, I, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Was, yeah. So it'll be uncomfortable, but like yeah. it'll make great memories. Yeah. Put yeah. yourself in those positions yeah. and like get out there because it's it's definitely worthwhile. Yeah. And I didn't have any internships in LA like, prior to me moving there, but I still, while I was in Phoenix, I had internships out here. I went to Sundance. I went to Cannes. So. Even if you feel like you can't go to LA for financial reasons or other reasons, like try to make the best of it here. You know, work with Kevin, that's what I did. And you can still sort of gain some experience and put it on your resume. Um, the one benefit that I got out of my internship was, first they let me go PA while I was interning there. So they actually allowed me to work at Kitchen Nightmares while I was an intern at the same time. And also, to go to that point of knowing somebody down there, I didn't have a place to live. I had one friend from high school down there, so actually, I met my roommates that I moved in with once I got the job at San Rio, based on the connections that I had at the internship. So, even if it's not to a job, it's just gonna be more helpful. They know somebody that knows somebody that has 
a room open or whatever, I mean, it's just going to be, I mean, I live in a garage, I live on a couch. <laughs> you you got to sacrifice certain things if you really want to do it, and that's kind of the LA thing, I guess. Yeah. You, you just have to, unless you're super lucky and you know somebody already. Yeah. Um, like, if your dad's already somebody, like, go do it, that's great, but um, <coughs> you just need to find as many relationships as you can, because it's only going to benefit you, and don't burn bridges, so yeah. mm -hmm. Seriously. if it's the biggest... Never. I'm not going to use that. Megan's horrible term that she used. But, uh, if you, have, you, know, you know what, assholes, you, don't, you just don't want to be in the <laughs> I didn't know if they knew what I was talking about. It's not that bad. Um, just, you want to make sure that at any given time you can always rebound from whatever you're doing. So keep the relationships into Megan's play. Like, that person that Glover uh, used to sit for, like, she reached out to her all the time. It's like just keeping those relationships going. I mean, I've talked to the people at Fox many of time. I've had interviews that they've given me. So it's just, it's very helpful. Yeah. Also, oh, I was just gonna say, in all honesty, you'd be surprised how many people also know each other. Yeah. So if you, mm -hmm. if you screw something up, like it's gonna get around and then it's, it's rough. So it's like, be a cool human being. It's not, it's not super difficult. I feel like we're making it sound like horrible. It's not that hard. The hardest thing to do is just getting a job once you're there. So just have a place to live in yourself. I was gonna say, you also know more people than you think you do because yes. the second you're like, I'm moving to LA, you're like, oh, my dad's best friend's daughter's cousin lives out there, you should hook up. And you reach out to that person. Say yes, yeah. like, say yes. And um, even if you're like, no one in my family works in LA, no one is even involved in the entertainment industry, you have friends, your friends have families. Like, you know, like you really do know more people than you think you do. And if you just start telling people what you want to do and where you want to be, you'll be surprised how many people try and offer to help you. Not to mention, look around you. You know, yeah. there's going to be people here who do make that leap successfully, and it'd be great if they're down with you sharing their couch. And collaborate while you're here. Work on state press TV stuff. Work on capstones. Say yes. It's improper, improper rules out here. Just like yes and. Yes, yes, and. yes and. Well, it's part of your major, right? A lot of you are probably doing collaborative writing room sessions. Knowing how to take a note, knowing how to get along with people, it sounds like common sense. You'd be surprised. Oh my god, so many people in the real world have no idea how to function as a social human being. So leverage your advantage. And your tech skills. Everyone here who can work a computer with any sort of competency, yeah. being be able so to install you will be the a printer, person in your office. being able to install a printer makes you indisposable. Like, you're set then. Because they can't get rid of you, you'll never be able to print again. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. You it's would not believe the tech terrible. problems we have all solved. Oh, yeah. <laughs> someone, else, someone once walked up to me and they're like, can you make the internet faster? I was like, I had there's 40 someone, people in this office. Absolutely not, I can't make the internet faster. I had someone not know where an app was on their phone because they couldn't figure out that you had multiple screens you could swipe through. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm dead serious. I was a hero. <laughs> you can patch some ethernet, you're done. You're doing better than you think already. Seriously. Seriously. So it's, so it's just the biggest reason that people actually don't get jobs is like, not being personable, not being someone want, people yeah. want to hang out with. That is the biggest thing. You can win out over people who have more skills than you do. Simply oh, by being like somebody being who want to be around yeah. you. I think every single interview I've ever gone into, I haven't thought about, I want to be the best person for this job. I thought, I want to be the person you hang out with yeah. eight hours a day. Yeah, because like, how yeah, great yeah, I can At the end of the day, we all work about like 10 hours a day. So your bosses are there pretty much the entire time. They just want to know <laughs> that you won't frustrate the crap out of them. And a lot of the like ways in, PAing on sets, working in a mail room at an agency, like the, the stuff that a lot of people get to do, that's just all about collaboration. Yeah. If you're the guy on set who runs around handing people water bottles before they realize they're thirsty, that might be the difference between you not working again and you being picked up by a production guy who likes you and is gonna bring you along to more sets. It's that easy, it's like little stuff like that. Being personal. Now, your advice is no different than uh, how I experienced it. When I graduated in July uh, from Michigan uh, in 1991, I was I picked up everything and was headed to LA in September. And I remember <coughs> crying to my parents like a baby uh, at Detroit Metro Airport. It was because I was making this big leap, but I knew everyone had to do it. And I didn't know many people there, so I had to find a connection, and that was my godmother's husband's first cousin <laughs> was an executive producer on The Simpsons. And that's, and, and that's how I... That's like great. That's pretty good. That's like a brand of Kevin. And I came in wearing like a seersucker winner suit uh, to Paramount, and I was laughed at. Scooby-Doo shirt underneath? I don't know what... <laughs> 
but it was, uh, I was hot and I looked ridiculous. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but let me ask you this, I mean, because when I was went out, I didn't have any idea, I knew I wanted to work in the entertainment industry, and I think like many other people, I know I want to work there, but I'm not sure what I want to do. What is it, when you st went out there, did you know what you wanted to do, and was it ex what you are doing now? I wonder if you could kind of touch on that, because uh, certainly I assume many people who are maybe juniors or seniors, even sophomores, going, I'm not sure, I just know I want to do something. Oh, we're going to start. Oh, are we not going to go start with the line? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Let's start with yeah, next. Uh, I did not see myself at Sanrio. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so for me, I, I actually thought I wanted to do so. I just wanted to be there. I knew I wanted to be in LA. I knew that's where I had to be. I wanted to work on films or TV. I just wanted to be there. Um, I always had a passion for brand and marketing, but I didn't think that I'd be able to get into that. So I thought just start somewhere. Uh, and like I said, I, in a million years, if you told me, yeah, you were gonna start at San Rio, I would have never believed you. Um, but even being there and understanding what they do, I kind of found what I wanted to do there. So it might take you a little bit of time. I will say this though, if you already know what you're passionate about, do that now. Like if it's producing content on YouTube, whatever, do it now because there's already 10 year olds doing it now. So we're already all behind, behind. So just get out there and do stuff if that's what you want to do. So if you find your passion early, go and go towards that direction. But also realize that you need flexibility because it might, when you, once you get there and you're working on that thing, it might not actually be what you want to do. So just remember not to put all your eggs in one basket. Find something to kind of also be passionate about later, but have some kind of want when you go out to LA. Um, I knew that I wanted to do something um, in the film world, but I knew that I couldn't be picky. So when I went to LA, I literally applied for everything, whether it be reality television, network television, film, like I literally could have done anything. And I was lucky enough to land a job at a studio and I kind of fell into the distribution team, which um, wasn't necessarily what I, wanted to do, but it was something that I was still very interested in, and so I ended up doing theatrical marketing within distribution, but because Open Road is so small, I was able to work with nearly every department, which kind of gave me access to the inner workings of a studio, and that allowed me to sort of figure out what I really wanted to do, and even though I'm in theatrical marketing right now, I I know that I probably won't be for a long period of time, but I have an idea, having worked with the different departments within a studio, that I kind of maybe want to go into development or acquisitions, and I know people who work in it now, so that, that did end up helping me in the long run. Yeah, I don't think you or I knew what distribution was before yeah, we came out, no. we both wound up. When I went out there, I knew I wanted to work in TV specifically, and I wanted to do something creative, but I was open to possibilities. And I had no idea that distribution existed or what that means, and it's still sort of a nebulous concept to explain. But um, like I said with my, are you laughing at nebulous? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, someone liked nebulous in the back, so that's fine. Like um, Taco Bell liked it. Talk, oh, God. Yeah, I saw someone really liked that in the back. You were here so. for me, thank you. You didn't see um, it, but. Anyway, so I, I, I had my internship, like I said, and I was in marketing there, and I, I really liked marketing. And then the woman, Carissa, vouched for me at the, the current job, and then I, it's just, it's so fascinating, so interesting how you get content out there, and it turns out I really, really liked it. But sitting where you guys are now, I had no idea it even existed. So I would just stay really open-minded, because there, there's like a wealth of opportunity out there that you're, you don't even know of, or that we don't even know of now. Mm -hmm. And you want to remain adaptable if you remain, um, single-minded in what you want to do unless you're like super, super passionate. And you, you might sort of cut yourself off from other opportunities. So I would just meet as many people as possible, get their stories, find out what they're doing, ask a million questions. Like you should have a, a wide understanding of how everything works, not just your, your specific will you. You're laughing, will you? I didn't. I thought will you was great. Will you okay? Both people understand that one. So anyway, I knew I wanted TV, but I was open to opportunity. That's all I have to say, God. Here you go. Your turn. Here's the mic. Um, um, I agree um, that you should. I agree. I agree. Um, um, I very much want to write for television, specifically comedy, and I have wanted to do that since I was like a sophomore. 
So that much I feel is not going to really change for me, and that's really, wanna, really where I want to go is like some more creative. And I don't feel like um, from studying things in the industry and just like learning about different um, departments, there's nowhere I feel I would fit better than in a writer's room. So that's ultimately where I want to get to, and everyone that I meet is a it, I, I treat as like a possibility to maybe one day get where I want to go. So um, I know what I want to do, and I'm not there yet. But I feel like the more you stick with what you, I feel like the more you stick with what you really want to do, the people who really want to do it will find a way to get there. I um, there's just so many outlets. There's so many places to write, there's so many things to write for, now that like even like Yahoo is doing original content. Now there's so many different companies that are going to start producing original content and that's going to get a lot more diverse writers and a lot more creativity on television, which I really want to be a part of. So as far as working where I do right now, I think it's a great opportunity to meet people and there's a whole group of writers that are writing for for Jamie Foxx next week and they're like, you know, like they're writing it like this week because it's going to be all current kind of like, you know, things like that. So it's really interesting to be around those kind of people and see how they work. And I've heard really great ideas come out of the room. And I've also heard really shitty ideas come out of the room. So it makes me feel great about myself. Because I'm like, at the very least, I can be that guy in the corner with the shitty idea getting paid the same amount as everyone with the great ideas. So I don't know. Aim, aim high. So aim high. Aim just below. Um, but so I have said for since I graduated that I watch TV all the time. I'm a huge TV person and that I know that a lot of TV sucks. And so if whoever's writing for those shows can do it, there's absolutely no reason why I couldn't do it too. So that's kind of the attitude that I've had going out there and I am gonna make the most of every opportunity someone will give me. Sure, you do a good job of that too. Uh, I, I'm the same as Della, I moved out, I've wanted to write for TV since I was 11, so I win. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so, you know, I moved out there, that's what I wanted to do. I studied, uh, I studied screenwriting while I was here. And uh, I work at a production company right now, so it's a lot of development. Um, it's not 100% what I want to do, but uh, it's in that vein. I want in that, yeah. I want in that world. Tell me your words. Oh, oh, I won an award. <laughs> She's award winning. Yeah. I'm the award winning Allison Miller. Uh, I want I, you know, one of the huge benefits to my job and one of the reasons that I, that I was really excited when I got it is uh, my bosses were away a lot. And so they're like, hey, there's going to be some downtime while we're producing this musical in New York. Um, you know, so you can feel free to work on your stuff. I worked on a script uh, that I had started while I was a student here and I rewrote it and I won the World Series of Screenwriting and that was really, really cool. And so it's important as you're doing whatever job that's like, clearly I don't want to be an assistant for my whole life. So while you're doing those jobs, make sure that if you want to be a writer, you should make time to be writing and you should be using the resources of people who have here. Like Patrick has a writing group that like we go to a lot and that's a great place to just bounce off ideas. You know, I pitched a couple of like web series ideas and then forget to do them, but whatever. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's- The conversation is happening. Exactly. It's a good pitch. Yeah, exactly. It was a great pitch. And then that one time we shot it, it was also fun. Um, but, uh, you know, and it's, it's just make sure, I would say that your first job doesn't super matter. Um, in the sense that if you want to write, if you want to do scripted, go to a job in scripted. If you want to do non-scripted, go to non-scripted. Those jobs don't necessarily translate. And that's, that's the biggest thing that I've found. Um, if you take a reality job, you're most likely going to be moving upwards in reality. If you take a scripted job, you'll move upwards in script, scripted. And those jobs are harder to find because there's just less of them. So just make the most out of your time. Make sure you're constantly writing. Patrick and I write a lot of stuff together because you know use your resources here. Especially in the screenwriting program, you guys basically sit in classrooms and workshop stuff together. So that's like, like Del and I took screenwriting classes and together, and now we're like gonna work on that cool web series thing. Yeah. So like, it's use your resources. Make sure that if you want to do something, if you're passionate about it, it'll happen. Like Make every time. yeah. If you're an editor, edit. If you're a writer, write. If you want to produce, like put like I mean, put together pitches for things you want to produce. I mean, it's even if it's not good, and even if it's not like high caliber, put something down on paper and just keep working on it because it'll get better. Yeah. And then like any any time I've. Your passion is really what sets you apart, and your ability to sell yourself is what sets you apart. Anytime that you that I've had meetings with like managers or anything, they want to know what you write, who you're like, where you want to be, and you have to be able to answer those questions really, really succinctly and clearly. So just you know, 
know who you are. I don't, I, like I was telling you guys earlier, I saw this thing online where people were like, don't ask a writer what they write about. They'll be really upset at that question. They won't know how to answer. It's too complex. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not. Do you want to write hour-long drama with female leads who are witty and sassy? Okay, cool. <laughs> That's a very specific thing. That's the dream. That's the dream. Who would that be? Who could it be? Like, it's, it's very easy. It's just make sure that you know what you write. And if you're good, people will tell you that you're good. It's not, like, people are pretty blunt. If you get your script to a place, they're going to tell you whether or not it's good. And if you're consistently hearing it's bad, either take another class or see maybe you like development. Maybe you come up with these great ideas and you can't. That's not, hey, Patrick. That's not what I meant. You're still one of the best. Make the most, right but make the most, make the most out of the skill set that you have. If you're really great at ideas, but you can't write that well, then yeah, you should do development. If you write really, really well, but like have weird ideas, maybe you should do stand up. Like, <laughs> tell stories. I don't know. But just like what, what you have, use what you have. You guys have skills, I'm assuming, correct? Yes, good. Okay. Use your skills and blend them with your passion. That's the best that you can hope for and to achieve. Yeah. Patrick, now tell them about how shitty your job is. <laughs> well, they said it all already. They've Every conversation in LA starts with what do you do, and then the follow-up is always what do you want. Yeah, no always. matter what you're doing, you could be directing films, and they'd be like, "Yeah, but what do you really want to be doing?" So don't expect to work in what exactly what you think you want to work in. If you do get there and you discover it's exactly what you thought it was going to be, and it's the dream, great, fantastic. More often than not, you're going to figure out it's a little bit different, and maybe something's a better fit. And just basically, more so than take any job, which you should. But don't close yourself off just because it's not the exact path you want to be on. If you get a job at an agency and all you're seeing all day long is the business side of things, and you're like, all I want to do is write, this is creatively dead for me, pay attention to what they're talking about as far as what's selling. The, the logic of what sells and what doesn't does not follow doesn't any exist. common sense at all. You would not believe the things, these weird outside circumstances that cause certain projects that are otherwise good to completely tank or get written off and vice versa. You learn what people are actually buying and selling and then maybe when you do your writing, you're a little more targeted towards something that people are actually gonna be excited to read. So just pay attention to whatever benefit you can be getting out of whatever job you find and like Della said, a lot of what you read is going to be really encouraging because it's going to be crap. And you know that you're going to be able to do better. And you'll either be just completely disillusioned with the whole process, how could this stuff be selling, or you'll think that, hey, I can do better than this. Let's go. Yeah. Now, now, what has made then you guys successful and other people not so successful? You certainly you have friends. You want to shit talk, Kevin? Huh? <laughs> you guys to gossip about our peers? No, no, that's the issue. Don't name anybody specific. Uh, but it's like, why have you gotten so far? What What is it that you've okay. done? And what is it that you've noticed that other people perhaps have done that didn't get them to where they wanted to go? Start with you again, Nick? Anyone can start. Oh. I don't want to toot my own horn. I'm pretty awesome, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, for me, I, I always look at myself as not being the most amazing person because you have to put yourself into perspective of like how many people have done that before you, how many people are successful, but at the same time, if you're not confident in what you're doing, you are going to fail. People will feel that, they'll read that off of you, so you have to portray a certain, um, I don't know, self-esteem, I guess, to it. Um, like an intersection of humility and confidence. Mm -hmm. yeah. right, like it. be willing to do like some like as an assistant I had to wash dishes. Like yeah. that wasn't I have two degrees. I didn't want to wash <laughs> dishes, but that's yeah. what I did. And I did it like w with an affable attitude. Like I would wash them be like, look at me. I don't know, I wasn't like a vaudeville act, but <laughs> look at me. <laughs> no, but like try and like 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 take it with a smile. Like you know that what washing dishes is what you want to do, or maybe it is, I don't know, live your dreams, but <laughs> So there are, and there are, it is, there's a lot of opportunities yeah, for you. There, yeah. there will be things that you don't want to do that you can't stand doing, but if you do it with a good attitude and with also the confidence, like, like you can understand that it's not great, but just making everyone's lives easier around you is, is, is super helpful. And then, yeah, just maintaining, like just being happy and being positive and like helping people out and being funny, like making the hours go by, because you, you will be in the trenches with these individuals and you want to be in the trenches like with someone who's cool. Yeah. And there are definitely individuals in every office and you can point them out that you're just like, oh, she's awful or he's has a terrible attitude and you just don't want to be around them. To be fair, thank God for those people. I know, yes. Yes. Great conversation starters. <laughs> oh, yeah. Nothing unites two people 
more than being a parent. Bond over person. someone you hate. <laughs> no, but just like taking on projects and working in groups, like you will do individual work and you will do group work in any setting, whether it's production, writing, corporate, it doesn't matter. You will have to manage those types of, of environments. And you want to be the person who can work in any situation. You want to be reliable, dependable, independently, but you also want to be able to work collaboratively. And um, just, yeah, maintaining that sort of like positive nature, I think, is, mm -hmm. is imperative. Otherwise, people are just going to push you <coughs> to the side, and you won't get opportunities, and you won't get projects, and you'll be forgotten. Yeah, I mean. Don't be forgotten. Yeah, yeah. Try, yeah. try and be as cool as possible. <laughs> not, like, I'm like seething with anxiety on the inside, but if I'm at work, I'm like, I need to be cool. I need to put on a good front, and like, make friends with people in different departments. Don't yeah. stay at your desk. Don't just stay with your, within your department, because I went yeah. to publicity. Finance, acquisitions, I made friends with everyone so that when I was interviewing for my second job, I can secure these interviews because of these people that I knew. And that's how I got them. And you, you will work with everyone at one point. Yeah, yeah. You might think that you'll stick within, like, for me, it's my marketing team. But now I manage a budget, so now I work with finance, mm -hmm. and I already built those relationships. Yeah. Like, you there, you will touch everyone's life in your work environment, so yeah. just remember that when you approach. Are you saying touch? Yeah. You're not going to, like, Sorry. touch people. <laughs> oh, my God. I can Sorry. hear you. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, go for it. Yeah, I'm going to say along those lines that all the work that I've done is PA work um, in L.A. so far. And um, it's not always the greatest. And sometimes it's like you're doing a coffee run for like eight people and they all have different really complicated orders. Or sometimes you're organizing a supply closet that's just in shambles. Or um, sometimes you just have to do stuff that like really sucks you don't want to do, but I try really, really hard to be like the most positive person in the room at all times. And the number of times that people have just said to me like, I can't believe that like you can take out the trash with, like a smile on your face. So I'm like, well, it's got to be done. So I mean, it, it, do it. The, uh, is the president going to do it? Like, probably not. You know what I mean? So like, someone's got to do it, and if that person's you, then that person's you, and you yeah. put a smile on because no one likes a stank face. No, <laughs> no one likes stank no face, and people face. remember stank face. No one's trying to hire someone with stank face. No, they do. I remember somebody I probably did it before you too. So don't yeah. act like you're the first person that yeah, ever check out the yeah. trash, or that they probably did too, and they respect you all the more because they know that that's what it took for them too. Yeah. Yeah. Also, <laughs> and it's more related to you, you had an also. I was just saying also all I do all day long is hear people complain about things and it's like the most unattractive thing yeah. ever. Um, like bringing someone lunch. <laughs> I brought a guy lunch and he, uh, he like ordered a sandwich and he walked out and there was a sandwich with like a little salad and like some fries and he goes, I didn't order all these things. And I was just like, mm. Comes with that. I was like, if I had like said words, I probably would have gotten fired. So I just looked at him like this, mm. and he goes, "I'll eat around it." And like, mm. <laughs> like, I mean, uh, people don't have ridiculous requests, and you have, to, and like the other thing is, you have to know when to like take the request, but also don't let yourself get walked all over. And just because you're a PA and just because you're taking out the trash doesn't mean that anyone can like talk shit to you or like I don't know, talk like make you do things that like they can do perfectly well themselves. The, yeah, there is a difference between like being uh, like a good assistant and like being in a toxic work environment. So make sure you're aware of that. Like mm -hmm. I know of some places where that are that are bad. Believe me, more often than not, people at bosses are really, really nice because we're getting to the age where we the assistants who are now bosses like came of age in the era of being yelled at and they're like, I hated when that happened to me. So as a human person, I'm not gonna do that to you. <laughs> So it's 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 not as terrible as it sounds, but at the end of the day, like everyone, every person that you're friends with is going through like the same kind of like shitty work that you're doing. You know, like a huge part of my job is like reminding my boss that he has pants at the tailor, and then he like, and then I have to go get them. So it's not like it's not it's again. I also have a degree, and I didn't get it to you know pick up pants from the tailor, but like so what? Like at the Nothing end of the day, he's gonna yeah, he's gonna vouch for me whenever I. Get it when I get my next job. So, it's it's really a trade off. There's no yeah. there's no point in caring about. It. And worst case scenario, the bathrooms are for crying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Keep a positive attitude, but understand that you will have days where you just you're just like breaking down. Yeah. Like cry in the car. That's the best That's place the, to cry. No one wants to see you cry. Yeah. No, it's it's fine if you do it. Everyone has. It's, and it's, we, okay. we don't mean to say that like oh my god your life is gonna be so terrible you're gonna cry. It's just like sometimes you're all, there and it's yeah. we've all cried. Like, sometimes it's just like it's oh hard. this is my job hard. I've been here for a long time I really like I just want to be doing the thing I want to be doing mm. and like. That's gonna happen to everybody. So like, 
Nothing wrong with a good so cry. So there's nothing wrong with a healthy cry. This is well, a problem. That's what dads dads are. Yeah, yeah. Too. That's yeah. a good one. Because uh, they'll be like, yeah, I've done it too. So I don't know. That was my. That, I didn't really have the cry in the bathroom situation as much. Uh, but I definitely had the, hey mom, hey dad, like on the way home. And they're like, they'll talk you out of things and make you feel a little bit more comfortable because they've already been, well, most parents are working, but not a lot of them do. But, um, that's that one thing that you can kind of go back to. So you have yeah. a little bit of a comfort bubble. So don't so be afraid me. to call mom and dad. Call mom and dad. I called my mom crying in traffic the other day. I'd like to ask you guys something related to your success since you're talking about it. You guys are, I mean, and this is partially because we have so many underclassmen here, um, and they still have a couple years to go. You guys were the, the cream of the crop of students here, I mean, too. I guess, it, I guess it goes without saying, but can you talk a little bit about the things that you did here uh, that helped you succeed, helped you with the competitiveness of, say, internships, and then prepared you to go out there and be ready. I'll let you guys start on that side. Because, you know, <laughs> my favorite some of our best is like, Patrick, I still remember your Archer spec script. That's how good it was. Thank and, you. And, and, you know, I Nella, of course, you were you know, one of my best friends. So, you know, it, it, it starts here. So can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean... Just be the best person in your class, yeah. I guess, is basically yeah, what my friend is saying. The, um, no, just take opportunities outside of your classes. I mean, really, pay attention to what you're learning in your classes. It's been really valuable information, and the opportunity to do table reads and to workshop your work is invaluable. I'm really lucky because we've managed to string together now three straight years of every single Tuesday night we do a writer's group. And it's been everything from improv to sketch to workshopping things. And that's been enormous as far as continuing to grow. And you have that baked into your curriculum if you're studying screenwriting. So that's fantastic. And then in addition to that, I, I don't know how many of these opportunities are still available, but State Press, uh, I went and just pitched them a show. And we only filmed two episodes and then it fell apart. Um, but there was another show that I was involved with that had a different showrunner on it that we wrote for four years. And it was just topical, random humor, and it involved the commitment of like one or two nights a week. And that was the experience of being in a writer's room that we completely controlled before getting out into the real world where that's years away. Um, on top of that, the Sundance uh, internship was fantastic to just talk to people who are making films on a budget and outside of the studio system and really seeing what's possible. Um, go talk to people from other majors who are making things. Uh, the Zucker internship was huge. That one was really valuable for me. Uh, come be my intern. What a great be, opportunity that enormous, would be for you. Such a good opportunity. <laughs> Uh, yeah, like, I, I mean, I uh, I started a club while I was here. I think that, that fell apart, right, Kevin? That doesn't make sense. That's gone. Yeah, that's gone, right? Uh, yeah. It's uh, started. It's, it's retired. It's retired. It's retired. Yeah, okay. uh, yeah, but I, like, I started, they, they had the, the <coughs> film association, FMP did it, and, and I went to there with, with my good friend Freddie over there, and, and all they did was talk about, like, movies. And I was like, well, I mean, I like movies, but I also like mostly other stuff. I really like TV, and that's what I wanted a club where we talked about TV. So I did that, and uh, we built, like, I don't know, a, a, a decent following during my time here. And then, like, I don't, I don't know what happened. I didn't really follow up, so I guess that was my bad. But, um, uh, you know, it's just, I think the best experience I had here was, like, all of my screenwriting classes. You guys don't know how valuable that experience is. Um, we created uh, like our one of our in our senior year like we all wanted to do independent study and write scripts for Chris Bradley and then he was like hey a bunch of you guys asked us that can he we made us a class yeah he made us a class it was a great class we were it was basically all like, six of us yeah my six of us and and at that point we were all the like higher level screenwriting students so we weren't wasting any time uh, so it was it was you know that's a really great experience and you can constantly be writing it's really, really hard once you graduate and have a job and need to physically take care of yourself that, like, to write on your own time. So that's And to find people willing to, to read, read your, your stuff, stuff. Yeah. let alone read your stuff with you there to workshop it with you. So, like, that's... I came out of here with, like, several script, script samples that I, like, got to managers right away. So, like, that's... I maybe shouldn't have sent some of those. But like once I refine them, and then I, you know, I'm getting calls. You want a contest? I want a contest. <laughs> Believe me, look at how good I am at everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess I would say that I've always been like very neurotic in that I want. 
And not like I was like always <laughs> like throughout school. No, like oh. it, it's like for real. Like like throughout school and throughout like college and even like my master's program, I was like even more so than my parents or like all of my friends who were cooler than me. I was like I'm gonna get in any of this. So like I really seriously worked really really hard in all of my classes to do the best job that I could on every single assignment. Um, and I was lucky enough to work in the front office um, when there was a front office for the film department. And um, so I got to know, I got to know all, all these professors really well and I got to make connections through there. Um, I kind of immersed myself as much as I possibly could in the things going on and the internships happening. Um, and I think a lot of it, a lot of, I think, I think, I mean the capstone class also was like really great because we got to like design and create our own projects and which is, which is unbelievable because how often do you get to actually create the assignment that you get to fulfill? Um, so definitely take advantage of that and like all the things that, especially, I think, the thing about humanities is, you guys, you can't be wrong. You literally, it's not math, it's not science, like you can't be wrong. If you can defend your opinion, then like no one can really talk, like, you know, at the end of the day, you're like, this is how I saw it and this was my take on it. So that's what, you, that's what I wanted to represent and that's what I feel that I have. And as long as you can say that about whatever you do, work-wise, creatively, otherwise, if you can like feel confident and um, be able to, to sell yourself or be able to like uh, make, just do the best that you can at everything that you do and that'll show and people will remember that. And all of your interests, like do extracurricular stuff beyond yeah. just yeah. the... I was going to say like independently educate yourself, like mm -hmm. don't rely solely on the education you get here at ASU, which is of course fantastic, but read the trades, follow critics, uh, mm -hmm. you know, when I came out to LA, most of my coworkers didn't have sort of like... Like they work in TV, but they have a very like narrow view. But I understood the overall landscape, which I think has served me well. So take an active interest in the in the industry beyond just what's taught here, and then also start building your network now. Um, Freddie, who and, and Nick and I, we all have the same class with Kevin. We all remain friends. I lived with Freddie for a while. And I'll tell you guys later about that. But um, but anyway, start building your network now. Like the people here in this classroom, you could all move to LA around the same time. We kind of built that sort of like LA family, which was has been. Providing. That, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's really, really important. Yeah. Because yeah. at the end of the day, when like when things are terrible, you have your people. Yeah. Like everybody, you have terrible days here. I'm assuming you. They're not really terrible, but they feel like they are. But like <laughs> once you once you move to LA, like they're gonna be terrible. Have your people. But that starts now. Like that starts, starts in this classroom. Starts like yeah. hang Tuesday out. Tuesday nights are my sanity. Yeah. And then also uh, speak with your professors. If you have an interest in something, like like I said, be bold, don't be bashful, ask for something. Kevin was very helpful in getting my internship mm -hmm. and a Nick's internship, and I think for yours as well. So yeah, so speak up, don't hide in a classroom, like make yourself known, because it's very easy just to be <coughs> invisible. Yeah. yeah, and just consume Definitely. media, like consume the readings, like she mentioned, read the trades. I cannot tell you how many people when I was in FMS, didn't know it was on television, didn't know it was in theaters. It's a very simple thing that you can easily like research and understand. And Deadline you sends email blasts. Yeah. yeah, if you have Twitter, Super follow easy. every, like yeah. follow Deadline, Deadline follow the rap, the yeah, all of them, right. all the critics, because they, they're helpful. And a good deal of conversation in LA is talking about what's, mm -hmm. what's on TV, what's, what's yeah. coming out, what's current. If you don't know what's out there, then you can't hang in the conversation. You should know the overall structure, like what show, like the networks, the, the corporate structure, mm -hmm. the programming groups, like you should have a working understanding of, of yeah. really <coughs> most, yeah. most things, just so that you can enter a conversation knowledgeable and people won't be like, how do you not know what Viacom is, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that's super valuable, especially if anybody wants to be a writer, like you should know right now, networks want diversity. Mm -hmm. Like Empire is mind boggling, it's the biggest thing that's Represent. happened in the last decade. Mm -hmm. You should know people want diversity. Write something diverse. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's it. There you go. Don't be CBS. Don't be CBS. <laughs> CBS is falling apart at the seams. Yeah, big bang. That's about it. On that subject, and just a, 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 give me a quick answer, and then I'll open it up to everybody. Um, diversity, you know, know that. What's the next big thing? What should people, you know, be immersed in? Oh. Uh, what would you suggest to them? Nick? Anything Sanrio. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't really live in their world as much, so I can't necessarily speak to like what the next thing is going to be. Um, I think a lot of the industries that we started out in are going to be, not dying, but I think they're just going to be transitioning to something else. I think media in itself is, just how you consume media has changed, I mean from when I graduated to now, it has already changed 
I mean, I can't even put a word to it how much has changed. Um, so, be, I guess to their point too, is when you're researching anything, like just be ahead of the game. Know, and the other thing about being ahead of the game or just knowing something, the people that you're gonna be working with don't have the time. So if you do know that, you now look like a genius. And they're like, oh my God, how did, so then they go to you for things. And that's how it opens up your route to promotion. Not that I'm saying we all got promoted right away or anything. It's just that if you are that person that you are the knowledge person, or if you're the go-to for, hey, what happened uh, with this and this? It's only gonna help you even more so. Um, so I'll let them answer as far as what they think the next big thing is gonna be. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, not to uh, name drop my own company, but I'm going to. Um, as, so I just joined STX Entertainment, which is a new studio in town, and they wanna be considered a major, so they wanna be considered the next Paramount, Fox, Universal, et cetera. And what I've seen even at Open Road is that a lot of the studios are becoming a lot more leaner and they have a lot more competition. So it's not just the big six anymore. You have Amazon Studios, you have Yahoo mm. producing content, Hulu producing content, Netflix is making films now. Yep. So there's a huge um, change, a huge shift in the industry that's happening and they're not going to hire as many people so it's going to make it more competitive but at the same time you have a lot more options than just the studios. Yeah. I think for me and my my group, it's about uh, the cable bundle and over the top services. Uh, HBO just released HBO Now, which is a, a direct to consumer option. So for us, it's about how do we get ahead of the of sort of the dismantling of the traditional cable system. How do we get out to consumers in a way that is um, still cost efficient? Like we have FX, which is a wonderful network and it has all these hits, but um, the way our bundle is set up that you, you can't really like direct to consumer promote that. So our group um, is just trying to manage how do we distribute content in a way that doesn't completely upend the way current content and networks are monetized. Oh, wow. Such words. <laughs> <laughs> Damn you. I came, I came here to slay. Damn you. <laughs> <laughs> Go. What do you think? I feel like right now and in the next in the next couple years for the foreseeable future, um, television the landscape of television is uh, like really paramount in driving the way that people see the world and the way that people are consuming media and creating media, and not to hate on film, but um, I've always been I've always been a just bigger fan of television just because the, the, the whole process is expedited. It's a lot more current, it's a lot more now. Things can happen one week and it's on television the next week on a, on a sitcom or it's on uh, any, like the nightly show or any of the you know late night news stuff. So it's just so much more current and like up on those events for me that I think that television is going to continue to do that and especially with a lot of places creating their own content and um, like writing coming from all these different places and production coming from all these like new areas that it's just going to become, I'm so excited for it because I don't think it's going to be dictated by four perspective or one perspective anymore. I think it's going to like really open up a conversation onto a lot of different. Which is really what we're saying. Yeah. Like people want content that's different. Yeah. Um, which you, was, are you, are you still going? No, no, I'm done. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, which was my, my point towards diversity. People want, I don't know if you know this, but previously like a lot of TV was written from the perspective of a like white man protagonist. I, like, I don't know if you mind, I don't know if you guys have seen that, but that's uh, that's pretty much where it was coming from. Uh, we're we're seeing a, a very prominent trend that like people are aware that there are other audiences out there, and that's that's really really cool because it's way more interesting. Um, but like all right, so I talked about that already, but I. So I guess I'll, I'm going to change your question, and I'm going to tell you what I think is 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 done now. From what I've heard. here's 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 what we're over. We're over period pieces. Uh, Mad Men did their thing, and then everyone wanted their period piece. Everybody wants their modern stuff right now. There's there's not a huge market for period pieces and stuff, and then you know just so. Um. I would say a lot of times people want what is already successful, so they're always playing catch-up. Yeah. The best thing you could possibly do is look around you at the trends and habits and what your friends are doing and try to identify some sort of shift that TV hasn't picked up and reflected on yet. If you see something, a pattern with the way your friends are going about dating or life or anything like that and you can come up with your own take on that, 
you are an in-touch youth. You can sell that angle yes. to people just based on being like, I'm a part of this generation. They don't understand us. If you can try and be like, no, this is how we function, you're doing well. But the cool part about the cool part about being such a broad landscape now is you actually can afford to get a little weird, a little niche, a little bit out there. There are buyers for stuff that otherwise would not be touched by the majors. And if you don't want, you know, yeah, if you want the major network big dollars, then you can write those sites of shows. But if what you truly want to do, if your voice is absurd comedy or some sort of niche drama, don't do period pieces. Uh, do it because you'd be it's a really wide market out there. Yeah, and you, they, they are getting really, really specific. Yeah, they're getting really specific in their brand and what the kind of stuff they like. PlayStation, it, they're starting up their thing. They just have powers come out. They're yeah, they're very, very specific in who they're going after. They know their audience and that's who they want to target. So you have a lot of opportunity. The more niche you can make something, the almost the easier it will be to sell. Assuming your target is fire. All right, questions. Um, so besides just having like physical scripts that you can take on later, uh, how has um, you know the knowledge and experience of just assignments and the classes you've taken here just uh, help like directly translate to uh, being successful and finding work and jobs out in the industry? What do you want to do? Yeah. Um, Let me, let's tailor this let's question. Tailor this question. <laughs> so, so, the, so the question is, how um, how is the knowledge you've learned in, in classes helped to get you where you are? Um, I'm still figuring out even specifically, but I know that I really want to be in, uh, like a part of the creative process of okay. making like uh, movies or TV. Like I'm not specific, like you know commercials or like something on the web. I just I want to do creative stuff for that. Okay. So it's pretty broad right now. You learn to write. That's a really rare skill. People are terrible. I am asked to write emails on behalf of really major players all the time. I wrote an email to. Uh, I can't remember. You can't name. From a studio head to a major musician the other day because they weren't comfortable writing it themselves. So writing skills are huge. Any kind of writing skills. Beyond that, collaborative anything. Any way that you get in and are working and bouncing ideas off of other people, you don't get that opportunity a lot. That's huge here. And then, as far as the actual film studies, being aware of what you're trying to say is enormous. Yeah. The biggest thing I've taken away from working for the writers that I do, they're like, their secret, you can all have it, is you actually have to have a thesis to your whatever you're writing. Um, it doesn't have to be. <coughs> Think like a man. The idea was that the rituals of manhood have disappeared and the that now females have had to step in and be that ritual for the men in their lives. And that was, whether you agree with it or not, that was something that informed a lot of what that movie was about. And it was in every scene. So if you know what you're trying to say, if they can show you how to say the right, like what really craft what your message is about race, gender, and all that sort of stuff, if you truly have something that's your voice, you'll say, you'll stand out. Really true. That's the. Oh, this makes you sense. Go. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, like you're also shaping your worldview, which it, you know, is really going to inform everything that you are, and and it goes back to what Megan was saying about like just educating yourself and being like conscious and aware of the world around you, and you know, that's being able to relate film to like ethics and gender and you know all of these different factors that you are taking these classes on. That's huge. Mm -hmm. And being. <laughs> um, also, if you want to get bummed up a little bit more, um, bummed up. Um, bummed up. Bummed up. I did spend a year in England, so uh, it's a butt six. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I, I took. Uh, so obviously, I, I want to do screenwriting, and I have to say, I took screenwriting classes from both Green and from Christopher Bradley, and I took screenwriting classes in England. And the screenwriting classes I took here were far superior to the classes that I had at my master's program in England. Chris <laughs> Bradley's um, beaming. And, uh, no, honestly, honestly, like I'm not like honestly. Um, and I never and I never sit down to write something without thinking, okay, it's going to be a man. What kind of man is it going to be? Is he going to be controlling or is he not? Is he black? Is he white? Is he Hispanic? How does that inform his? Like I never don't think about that. Which is huge because you can't just make a character and in your head your character is is you because like most like I mean when I come up with an idea whether it's a guy or a girl protagonist I relate mostly to the protagonist that I'm yeah. writing and I have to really learn to separate myself out from that and create a character that's not me because that 
will open up such a wealth of information, such a, a huge landscape for you to create another world on. So if, as far as like what classes you're taking, what you're doing, I would also say give feedback to people and raise your hand and say something. And if no one has something to say, so say, say good job for completing something. Because you know what I mean? Because there's always something nice that can be said. There's always something that you can like say to encourage somebody. Because if you, I mean, I if you put something up and everyone reads it and no one says anything, you assume the worst and maybe you don't do that again. But if someone says, "Hey, congratulations on finishing it. Here's something that I, you know, here's an idea that I have. Or he, what if this character does this? What if you change the ending completely and now they do this instead? How does that change the rest of, the, of what you're writing?" So just constantly trying to evolve things and think about how you would take them from in your perspective, I think is huge in helping other people as well. I had two assignments from Kevin's class that directly correlate to what I do now. Um, you had us follow the season one marketing of Sons of Anarchy, which and now I represent FX. So I like my first day there, I was like, you guys remember that marketing campaign? They're like, oh yeah. I'm like, no, I know everything. <laughs> <laughs> and, then I, and then I ended up like marketing the final season of Sons that just concluded last fall. And then you also had us follow the marketing for an entire freshman series. So we followed. I don't know. No, we know. Uh, uh, it, it, it was the Joss Whedon Dollhouse, which was on Fox oh, Broadcast, yeah. and I worked on Fox <laughs> Broadcasting for three years. So every day when I was writing marketing, I was like, I remember, like, we followed like a deep dive into every aspect, like the premier marketing, post-linear, sustainability marketing, which I do every day of my life now. So the, I mean, that's a direct correlation to what I actually do right now. What class was that? Well, a media. You, you, that was USB and now our entertainment industry. And entertainment cool. industries, because yeah. that, yeah. that, that was both of them, because I yeah. was in the second one, but not the first one. Yeah. So <laughs> take Kevin's class. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> don't, don't underestimate, like, the classes here are so valuable. They're I have a really lot good. of friends that go to, like, USC, and it's just a really, really different environment. Not, like, there's less pretension in these classes. You kind of get actual knowledge, and there's there's a point to making your education practical. Like this event is awesome, and I would love. I like we. Kevin did stuff like this when we were here too, and it was that was some of the most valuable stuff that we did. Like we did a resume workshop. You wouldn't believe seniors coming out of USC that ha like hand in resumes with like colors and like <laughs> different fonts, it's ridiculous. So I, like, you, there's a lot of very, very useful stuff in this program. Do you still do writing, resume writing workshops? Uh, we, not this semester. <laughs> okay. they, but we've done it in Department of English, just done resume writing workshops. Okay, because I remember like, I had to cover my resume and I think you kind of scoffed at me. Because I had stuff on there from like high school and you're like, no one cares about this. Yeah. He's like, oh, okay. Kevin used his resume <laughs> for one of those resume workshops. Oh, did he? Left my, left left my, left left my left. All your information. I was like, you can use it, but just like block out my name and my address and like all my personal information. And he just like distributed it. <laughs> <laughs> I was, yeah. I was, was, was <laughs> Take And you can also, anyway. and a subject just of marketing, um, Julia Hinberg's, uh, what number you teach at marketing media industry? 394. 394. So, uh, on that subject. Another question. Another question. Come on, guys. Come on. Guys. Come on. I know we have time. Who inspired you? Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, basically, want to be this guy right here. I'll tell you what, mine's easy. I changed majors after watching a particularly brilliant episode of South Park. I thought it was comedy and satire and something to say all wrapped into one. I thought it was awesome and I signed up. Uh, I watched Buffy the Vampire Slayer when I was 11. Uh, I want to be Tina Fey. <laughs> My inspiration. SNL. I watched a million episodes as a kid, watched all the reruns, and then I was like, I have to be in TV. Um, probably Robert E. Or, or, Robert E. <laughs> Robert Eater. 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 Um, I grew up in Chicago, so that was my exposure to film. And he had a show every Saturday, and I would stay at home and watch it. And that was my like first. And now you work for the company that produced the documentary, Yeah, right? so yeah. now I work for STX is going to make a movie about a film that he made. And then, so it's kind of come full circle. So I don't want to seem like the sucker for anything, but actually when I got to FMS and I took Kevin's classes, that actually inspired me to get into. Um, I know it's, it's weird, but uh, Boom. Boom. Into, brand, into branding and into marketing. So actually, a lot of the points that he brought up in that, I wanted to kind of understand how that works. So um, when I got to San Rio and was able to kind of see how they do their branding and marketing, it only made me more excited about it because I had already done so much in his classes. So I don't mean to be that one guy who did this right now, but at the end of the day, it kind of... It wasn't it, it Hello Kitty? Of, yeah, no. <laughs> she did not inspire me. She, yeah. she inspires me now. Oh, okay, so okay. It's a little different. Okay. Yes? 
Taco Bell. Taco Bell. Taco Bell. Taco Bell. Taco Bell. <laughs> Full circle. Um, do you find that like the saying um, "Do what you love, and the money will follow"? Do you find that that like is true? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely not. You but, get paid like, nothing. Yeah, I don't so get paid when, to do when it. Do you, like, where does where does this transition when, happen? When you make like, money? Doing not like, doing stuff or for working for free and like oh, going okay. transition to like starting to. Have that's happening. Once, that too. once, once that money. happens, usually about the time you start running out of money. Um, <laughs> yeah. Like that's really that seems to be where I got a paying job. Um, but yeah. it's like it it depends really on what hard. you love. Do it like, when you can. I guess. Do it when you can yeah. is really the if best you answer. Can like, intern for free, do it. But if you can't, like find something else. Like. Um, to Allison's point, like I was running out of all my money and then I got an offer for CBS to be a page, but that's also because I was like desperate and I was like, I need a job and I was babysitting at the time and I was complaining to the woman I babysat for. She's like, I know someone at CBS and I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so yeah, just if you can, if you if you can afford to do that, that's wonderful. But there are um, there there are a wealth of opportunities in terms of paid internships now. Like Nick and I were just talking, we were like the last generation at Fox that was unpaid, and now they're all paid, for example. So um, yeah, I don't know, if you can, go for it. If not, find something that pays. And there's no yeah. shame in like waiting tables or yeah. doing like I think There's absolutely not. Outside. Like that stuff, and, and, and a yeah. lot of times that stuff might even be better for you, depending on yeah. what you want to do, because it is a really, really flexible schedule, and you know. You, you might not burn out as fast. Yeah, you have more time to, you know, do what you want to do. I think you don't, you don't do it for the money either, because yeah. it's yeah, just that's not like going to be that happy yeah. when yeah. you don't get there, or you're always going to be chasing that dream. Yeah. So do it for the passion of it, not necessarily for that big payoff. It's yeah, not, like, the, it's I, not I, the lottery. I mean, it's, like, yeah. it's a lottery, basically, and you're going to yeah. do that. You'll have a lot of lean years before you like, hit a exactly. threshold yeah. in which you're like, oh, I'm comfortable, I won't die tomorrow. Yeah, like, yeah like, I do, <laughs> and that's okay. I, I do my job right now for the money, but it is a clear stepping stone mm -hmm. to it's mm -hmm. a job that I need to have done to get to a job that I actually want to do so that's like yeah. that's part of don't it's do, there's no there's nothing wrong with starting small yeah mm -hmm. so like don't feel bad about where you start out you need to eat I, I think it's a competition of finding out where you fit really because yeah. you can do a lot of free work and you can meet people that way and then you'll get a job mm -hmm. and then you're working in a production office and you're regardless of what job you have you're like you're working with like a group of people, and you work you know, nine to six, and then you go home. And maybe it's not exactly what you want to do, but it'll pay bills, and it'll, you know, it'll get you money, and it'll make you contacts. And you never know when some when that job is over, or when you decide to leave, or if someone's like, oh, I know someone who works here, you can get this job. And so by stepping stone, doing stepping stones that way. Ideally, you would continue to take jobs that pay you a little bit more every time. Like yeah. you start, you know, you start like bottom level, like you know, like PA, like what I do basically, and like you just kind of think, you know, well, maybe maybe next time I'm a PA, I'll get paid, you know, a hundred more dollars that week, or like my paycheck will be a little bit better and a little bit better. Union. Yeah. You get union. Yeah, <laughs> union. A bunch more money. And yeah. I'll say like. And Oh, but I was just, just gonna let you guys know this internship is unpaid. Sorry, I, know it's nice. I did it for two summers. It's really not the greatest, but we'll buy you lunch. Yeah. <laughs> oh, most of we'll buy you lunch at work. Yeah. It's a pretty good deal, guys. I will say. Yeah, that um, lunch. Uh, I don't remember what I will say. I wrote it. You did. You really wrote it. I think it was gonna be really wise. <laughs> you can't do it for the money, but like you also can't do oh. your life for free. So keep an eye on it. But you. You're not going to start there, and it's probably going to take you a while to get there. Yeah, like, no, and no. especially no, for, your like, last one. Oh, yes. Okay, so especially for, like, writer's jobs, like, those jobs do not, they don't really come around until you've built your relationships. Like, a hundred, trying to be a writer's PA, I have to use, like, all of my contacts in production companies that are producing specific shows just to get your resume looked at. When you see, like, a writer's PA gig, posted on like a website or something, 100% not gonna read your resume. Like they put that out there to get stuff, but more often than not, you need to know someone to get that kind of job. So there's there's absolutely nothing shameful in like starting out at a really, really small production company or, you know, even, or, yeah, or working, working out of somebody's house if it's a legitimate company, that's totally fine. It makes sure it's a legitimate company. <laughs> no, seriously. <laughs> so. right. Well, Patrick, Allison, Bella, Megan, Holly, Nick, thank you all very much.